So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good night for many of you as well. Thank you for joining us. I have the pleasure to introduce you today to two to our members of the ISN Union Catholic Working Group. Uh, our title of today will be Secondary IA Nephropathy, Reality or Illusion. That is very provocative title. So I'm look, really looking forward to, to hear this uh, presentation. This is what I'm talking about today. It's a, it, it, it starts from um, a journey which started in 2018 when we started working on IgA nephropathy. And of course, as a pathologist, um, all my cues are going to be from tissue, what I've seen, and then I'm going to take you back a little bit into the basic sciences uh, from uh, what we already know from literature. So that's how we're going to go about it today. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So for the pathologist, uh, IgA nephropathy is an immunofluorescence diagnosis, and what we look for in our tissues is the presence of dominant or co-dominant IgA. Uh, it most commonly comes with C3 in 90% of patients. We see lambda accentuation. And it's very important to note that the, there is uh, glom to glom variability in the intensity of staining. In terms of uh, the histology, uh, this came out in the core curriculum, a carbon was part of it. We know that the uh, pathology can be very variable and it can range from a minimal change histology to something which looks very dangerous as crescentic endocapillary proliferative but the most common uh, pattern of glomerular injury is mesangial proliferation. There's a limited role for electron microscopy uh, in terms of uh, confirming the presence of these conventional immune type deposits that you can see here in the mesangium, as well as commenting on potocyte health, which becomes important, especially when patients uh, are frankly nephrotic. So that's, that's what it is for the pathologist. And then uh, as in all other glomerular diseases, the way that we look at the disease um, is same in IgA nephropathy. We say that it's primary IgA nephropathy when we don't find any other underlying condition or apparent etiology, and that it is secondary IgA nephropathy if it um, has um, some sort of underlying condition which we would connect to the disease. And what are these conditions? There's a whole long list. This is from Hepton-Stahl, seventh edition. And you can see number one is hepatobiliary diseases. Then you have GI diseases, rheumatological diseases, and then a whole host of infectious, neoplastic diseases, etc. So, but no consistent definition in literature, no specific really histological features to differentiate from primary IgA. Uh, this abridged list came out in the latest core curriculum. And it's important again to note that at the top, you've got the GI and you've got the liver diseases. For the pathologist, uh, not everything containing IgA is IgA nephropathy. We have a host of differential diagnosis, which includes IgA dominant IRGN, um, a subset of which would be staph associated GN, lupus GN, of course, um, IgA PGN MID, which is a proliferative glomerular nephritis with monoclonal immunoglobulin deposits, which is usually G3 kappa, but in some cases it could be IgA containing, and then some cases of ICM PGN as well. So before I really go on uh, to what we did, I think it's important to understand IgA. Uh, we know that there are two types of IgA. You've got the serum IgA in the circulation, which is predominantly the monomeric IgA1 in 90% with a little bit of IgA2 subclass. This monomeric IgA1 is produced in the bone marrow. And in the circulation, along with that, you have up to 10% of mucosa-associated IgA, which enters the circulatory pole. The mucosal IgA um, is in contrast, is polymeric or specifically dimeric, locally produced at mucosal sites, which is GI respiratory and genitourinary, and it could either be A1 or A2 subclass depending upon the site of production. Now, IgA1 is special. Why is it special? Because it has a hinge region, which is basically between the constant uh, uh, CH1, uh, heavy chain constant 1 and 2, and it is composed of an 18 amino acid uh, area in the hinge. And why is it important? It's important because it can undergo uh, O-linked glycosylation. And this happens with the serine and threonine residues, as you can see here. So they serve um, uh, as points at which glycation occurs. Now, the way that the glycation occurs is initially there's a core which contains N-acetylgalactosamine. So the, uh, that, that forms the core. And then there is variable either silation or galactosylation. So here you can see galactosylation followed by silation in series, or they can both attach to the N-acetylgalactosamine here. So out of the nine potential O-linked glycosylation sites, to date, we only know that six uh, can be occupied by the O-glycans. So the serum would have been monomeric, and the mucosal IgA, which is secreted, is dimeric. So you would have two monomers here, which are connected by this very important J-chain. And they also have a secretory component attached. So how does the secretory component come in? 